Hi, this is Decentered Media, conversations about community-focused communications for positive social change. Hello there, Rob Watson here for Decentered Media, and it's a rather gloomy and wet and slightly cold November evening, and uh, I've been working all day on uh, writing some blogs and I thought I'd just share some of the uh, ideas and thoughts that I've covered in these uh, in, in these bits of writing, uh, which relate to the media bill, the introduction of the media bill, and the community radio consultation uh, for analog radio that is now uh, started uh, now taking place. And um, as ever, uh, Decentered Media is supported and funded entirely uh, by me and by some contributors uh, via Patreon, which I'm very grateful for. So if you would like to help and assist uh, to develop Decentered Media and to allow me to make more content and write more uh, blogs and to do more, more research and to uh, uh, help other people learn and develop how to produce and create uh, community focused communications then uh, go to patreon.com slash decentered media and you can sign up for as little as three pounds a month every fortnight we have a drop-in session and meet a meetup session online where we talk about issues that are related to how community media makes a difference within our communities and what we can do to learn how to improve our media and this week we're going to be talking about, um, on Wednesday, 6.30pm, uh, we're going to be talking about how community radio and community media might be affected by two things, which is the introduction of the media bill, and connected with that is the uh, community radio order, which is a set of statutory uh, instruments which follow from that, from the media bill, uh, which shape how community radio is regulated and licensed. <clears throat> so the media bill is uh, f has formally been introduced to Parliament, and it is uh, there is a blog on the Decentered Media website where I've outlined some thoughts about this. Decentered.co.uk, uh, and you'll you'll find it on the uh, on the front, um, and it, it's been published on the Parliament. Parliament website uh, and the the bill kind of proposes a number of sweeping changes to uh, the way that um, media is regulated in the UK particularly uh, it's pro the proposal is that uh, there is some changes to the rule of the way public service broadcasters operate and there is also some changes to the way that people find content online so increasingly people are accessing television through apps on their smart TVs and they're not necessarily using uh, broadcast uh, through the aerial transmissions um, and they are the, the bill looks at ways in which uh, companies like Amazon and Netflix and uh, Apple, uh, any kind of streaming content, television-like content, is regulated as well because at the moment it's not regulated. And and some of this is kind of it's timely, but I'm more interested in the radio element of this, which is a, a, more of my area of expertise and concern and experience. And it will make some changes to the radio industry, which are the culmination of changes that have happened over the last uh, few years. And also, they'll have a long-lasting impact in for years to come. And I think we should really consider them and look at them in some kind of depth. And uh, what I'd really like to do, I've had conversations about the media bill in the past and about the way that community radio might be uh, developed in the future. And we should keep having these consultations and discussions because there are some issues that maybe don't get uh, the focus that they uh, deserve and they need to be explained and understood and it's always worth going over uh, and examining issues from different angles and to bringing different people in with different voices who can shape the conversation so if you want to take part in these conversations it would be great if you sign up to decentered media and uh, as I say, from as little as three pounds a month to help with that. Uh, you might also want to contribute and uh, help with the debate and the lobbying uh, effort uh, for this through Better Media. So Better Media UK, 
uh, search for them on on Google and and through Better Media we put together a uh, a collective a a, a, a collaborative uh, approach to enhancing people's media experience, media democracy, uh, our human rights in terms of ac- acting as uh, media producers um, and having access to platforms and content. <clears throat> so, so what I want to cover in 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 this kind of overview then is. Um, some of the proposals that relate to uh, radio, particularly, and and the way in which uh, the media bill will homogenise radio content, and I think we 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 don't you know many people in in practical effect this won't make much difference because many of the changes have already happened. What it will do is it will confirm and bake in these changes. So one of the proposals is. That on F, so there's a separation first of all between the digital platforms, DAB platforms, and the um, analog broadcast licenses. And what the um, industry, to use that for some people in the industry, it's not all of the industry. What some people in the industry want is the ability to flexibly change the uh, format of their station as they see fit. So. Yeah, East Midlands, Heart or Capital uh, might suddenly want to change to Classic FM or vice versa. Uh, I can't remember who owns which brand. Um, and th- there will be no test by Ofcom that says that so the, the legislation would remove any requirement for Ofcom to assess whether people living in a particular area, the East Midlands, the West Midlands, the North West, the South East, wherever, uh, have a range of services available to them. That will be removed. It will be a market mechanism. And this is already something which can happen on DAB. So they're pretty free to do the licenses that they've got on DAB. They can do with them as they wish. Um, and they can, uh, uh, but this will apply to FM and AM services. Um, and then they can uh, uh, the ownership of those stations in those areas. It, once you've established that you can change the own the, the the format of a station, you can then change the ownership of the station. It's said it's proportional that uh, having multiple companies own separate small stations. So, you know, a separate company for. Uh, uh, capital in Nottingham and a separate company for capital in Leicester is not regarded as being proportionate anymore because the format can just be changed. The only thing that will uh, they will be uh, obliged to do <coughs> is to carry a news and information service. So they will no longer be required to produce any content locally. So there will be no stations Potentially, this could be the, the way. And I, I, I imagine, uh, you know, I think we've got to anticipate all scenarios. But uh, what seems likely to me is that there will be a production house in London, for example, and it will create content which is badged up for uh, uh, a particular town, Leicester, Nottingham, Derby. And it will go out in that area and it will uh, have no studios based in that those towns. And the content will be identified as being relevant to that area. Um, But the only news and information that it will carry will be news and information that's uh, relevant to that area, supposedly relevant to that area. But there will be no obligation for them to employ journalists so they can uh, uh, employ a hub, what they call a news hub, so newspapers, you can franchise newspapers or you can use uh, uh, a news aggregating service. Uh, so you can franchise that out to a an online service that can use AI. So I'm, I'm sceptical that there might, will be any local journalism involved in checking stories. So at the moment, as, as we, we often see with our local newspapers now, is that they've just become about press releases, what they call journalism, and that the actual feet on the ground for journalists who to do investigations, to do build relationships, to understand the situations will kind of gradually evaporate, if not suddenly evaporate. 
And the media bill will enshrine this and take away those obligations that any radio providers would have. Now, they are talking about, that's for FM uh, services. On the DAB services, the pretty, you know, that, that will be relaxed to the point where only one service on each multiplex, and the multiplex is what carries the multiple radio stations. So it's one, one, one signal that carries multiple stations. Uh, only one of those services would need to be required to provide local news and information. So the rest can just be, you know, you can have up to 20, say 20 stations on a multiplex. So you can have 19 generic jukebox type stations, uh, none of which have to provide any news or information and only one of those stations would provide news and information. And that news and information is reduced to news bulletins, traffic updates, what's on guides, which can all just be fed through uh, a, a pro, a, 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 an information management process and, you know, churned out as an AI voice reader. There probably doesn't have to be any people involved. So I'm, I'm kind of really alarmed and sceptical about this because there is a break with the connection between local communities and local radio. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's it, we, we don't, in the legislation, the Broadcasting Act uh, 1990, I think, and the Communications Act 2003, there is no reference to commercial radio. It's called independent radio. So BBC radio and independent radio. And then later what was introduced was community radio as, as a separate area. And so the challenges that... Um, there is a break and there is a disconnection between local determination of our radio content. And the problem is, is that, uh, yeah, that's great if you've got lots of capacity um, and you're on DAB. Uh, but what if, um, I mean, the figures uh, recently uh, kind of indicated the BBC released, were forced to release some figures in a Freedom of Information request which has Radio 2, 40% of the listeners of Radio 2 are on FM still. This is after, what, 20, 25 years of DAB being introduced and pushed and sold. Uh, the fastest growing access to radio is through smart speakers. That's growing each year now. Um, and I saw a press release that the BBC have upgraded their app, so it plays through the Amazon uh, smart speakers. It will play... Uh, linked content in each room so you can go from room to room and these you know if you've got a broadband account uh, then you can and you've got you know enough money to get five or six smart speakers well there you go you can have your, fa your house filled with whatever radio content you want from around the world <coughs> but lots of people still listen on fm and am uh, are still viable mediums and what's happening is the uh, there is a push to uh, to turn off those frequencies, the FM and the AM bands, and to remove any stations from them. The the, the kind of digital switch off, as it's termed, which has been around since you know kind of the mid no mid noughties. and in twenty ten, the government's digital radio action plan uh, said that. Uh, what the anticipated change would be is that the big corporate brand-based stations would move to DAB and FM would be left for the small independent, local independent and community stations to use FM and AM as they see fit. Remember on AM, many of the national and international stations have, have come off those platforms. So there's an awful lot of frequency that's available. One change which has been promoted and proposed is to recalibrate the FM spectrum and the, 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 the uh, technical parameters that Ofcom base their availability of spectrum and the frequencies that stations sit on was defined in, I think it was the late 1940s or early 1950s when FM was being introduced. And the idea was that the BBC wanted high quality in-house, in-home uh, reception. They wanted a hi-fi level of quality, you know, suited for Radio 3. So this is why we have these enormous gaps compared to, say, if you could visit Spain 
there's a station every you know you move the dial and there's another station and that seems to work perfectly well there's you know areas where there might be interference but there's areas where it works really really well and we're stuck with a model of frequency allocation which was decided in a different era and the expectation is is that if you open up and change the uh the, the allocation of the, the the threshold protection between the stations in each area, each town, for example, you could probably have up to 10 or 20 new FM stations. In addition to small scale DAB, uh, which is introduced and again, another 20 stations. And the, remember the, 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 the regional multiplexers, the regional DAB multiplexers and the national multiplexers still use DAB. They're not forcing people to use DA, upgrade to DAB plus. So you could DAB maximum you're looking at kind of good quality you're looking at maybe 16 stations dab plus you could probably get to uh, to 26 stations um all comfortably managed uh, but not that many people have got da there was a recent report out by ofcom that indicated that not that many people have got dab radios and people aren't upgrading them and it's going to take some time and there's no requirement for the industry to push and provide them there's no trade-in scheme so we're kind of stuck with a technology which is kind of an i describe it as like a, a it's great you know a 1980s ford Cosworth Sierra Cosworth that's been souped up it does a really good job it's really fast but it's a 1980s car it's not a modern day uh, 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 vehicle and it doesn't meet modern day standards it does the job but it's it's kind of a legacy technology now and so our, our, our planning is based around that so one of the other factors that influences this is um, uh, you know a digital switchover is fine only at the point where there is an equivalent to FM and AM broadcasting. So there is something that covers the uh, the geographic location. So people who live in rural areas aren't uh, don't lose out. And also has the penetration within buildings. So DAB radio often can't uh, uh, broadcast into certain types of buildings, certain types of concrete or brick buildings, steel frame buildings, for example, DAB is largely useless. <clears throat> and if you have uh, streaming coming along at the same time, then people are going to move towards streaming and not DAB. It's not going to go away and it's a good technology. I'm not against DAB. I, I, I have an interest in supporting and promoting DAB. And I think by and large, it's fine. It works, but it's not the only thing. And what we shouldn't be doing is we shouldn't be forcing uh, anybody to take up DAB if they don't want to. If there's available spectrum on AM and FM, then the market should decide. So if we're going to a market deregulation um, uh, outlook, then it should be a true market deregulation output outlook. So we should end things like simulcasting. Uh, FM and AM licenses should be put, either be given up by the, uh, the, the the existing license holders or put back out to re-advertisement to see. You know, we, we don't forget we haven't had a test of this for a number of years because Ofcom haven't licensed any FM or AM stations for what, five or six years now at least because they've they've done some renewals for community radio stations and they've done some license extensions and they've changed the format of some of the commute the, the commercial st independent stations but what they've not done is 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 done anything which uh, brings new people in because they have to do their licensing in rounds uh, because it's regarded as being competitive because it was regarded as being scarce resource well if we're in a situation where it's no longer a scarce resource but it is actually a, a you know there's there's plenty of spectrum to go around well we don't need to do a competitive system we can drop that and we can do an on demand system because i can't see 20 stations stepping forward to you know uh, to, to 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 come into Leicester on fm um you know that's that's the difficult part but there might be four or five uh, people want to set up uh, radio stations whether it's independent or whether it's community and i think if the spectrum's there we should be using it and I always kind of remind people of the analogy that uh, 
just because we've got Spotify and Apple Music and YouTube and we can stream music now, uh, vinyl sales, uh, records, um, are actually more popular than they've ever been, they, than they've, they've been financially, they're more viable. I mean, I'm not sure I want to spend 20 or 30 pounds on, a, on, a, on an album, but uh, lots of people do and lots of people value having that. So why would we get rid of FM and AM? And another couple of factors, we've talked about this previously in past podcasts. What else are we going to use this spectrum for? You know, what what what's this going to be? No, there's no other use for AM and FM. Nobody's come forward with a good idea. Plus, we've got international obligations through the IBU uh, to make sure that we allocate this spectrum efficiently and, you know, people have access to it. Also, and not to forget that it's also we have a human right to communicate, you know, and anything which stops that. So I think we're in a muddle. And I think what happens with the media bill is not actually the the, the simple red tape cutting exercise that it's purported to be. I'd actually suggest that this is a, a kind of monopolization and it's a way of introducing protectionism to a Prof, a, a very profitable and very robust commercial radio sector, which seems to be quite happy to. If you look at the Radio Center website, for example, uh, and I, yeah, I'm fine. I look, I'm in favour of markets. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I'm not a communist. I'm not advocating that everything should be done by social ownership. I think markets really should exist where it leads to innovation, where it leads to market diversity where it leads to pluralism of supply, because that's how you generate best value. And that's how you create content that people have a choice and, and, and can, you know, can listen to a number of different types of services that suits them. What I think we're going to end up with the uh, the result of the bill is we're going to get a homogenization of stations based around half a dozen brands, Absolute, Virgin, um, you know, Capital, there's just going to be very narrow brands, which will play out very well. They'll be very good at what they do. They'll they'll bring in top personalities. They'll have large advertising spends um, and nobody else will be able to get a look in. And locally, uh, we'll just remove and take away any connection and any capacity that people have to talk for themselves, about themselves within their local area, their local place, their community. So this is something that should really be driving or driven by uh, the devolution agenda, the levelling up agenda. But, you know, kind of media for some reason seems to be disconnected from this. We accept what the media corporations tell us about viability. And what we don't say is that actually local communities, we, we you know, that actually there was a, a pushback by MPs about the BBC's cuts to local radio in England. And, and this principle, that pushback needs to be applied to the media bill regulations for radio because, you know, you're going to see um, an, a significant number of um, radio stations. Um, well, you won't be able to tell the difference. You won't be able to tell them apart. There will, you won't be able to trade and buy a, radio, a local radio station. You, you know, if somebody else wants to come and have a go and they've got, you know, money in their pockets that they can, you know, they can burn through uh, promoting a radio station, a local radio station. I'm, I'm, I'm all in favour of that. It might not be what I want to listen to, but at least it's part of an open market and it can be put out to test in the market. Whereas what will happen if the media bill goes through is uh, there will be no open via, you know, no open market for people to test and trade uh, stations. So I'm in favour of deregulation. I think if the large brands wish to uh, soak up uh, all of DAB, that's fine, but leave FM for independent, local and community radio uh, to do something different and to try out and connect with their audiences in different ways. Now, that, and they will never have the same kind of money uh, that the big brands have and the same kind of attention grabbing you know, kind of uh, uh, marketing. They'll, they'll they'll never have that. That's and that's fine. But they will enable people to have relationships uh, in their local communities and their local places that are about those places. You know, may, we we have a tagline on Leicester Community Radio, which is made in Leicester for Leicester. 
Um, and we're not really worried about too many other places. Uh, and I, I imagine, you know, made in South Shields for South Shields or made in Withenshaw for Withenshaw is is kind of it will have a place and we need to facilitate and support that so i think our mps need to call this in and need to challenge this because the uh, the culture media and support uh, sport committee was kind of quite passive and they've got this uh, you know the, the the watching the evidence and the questioning uh, it didn't really probe into any any great detail about whether this was a, a desirable thing for our city or democracy uh, never mind for consumers uh, uh, who are buying products. You know, as citizens, we should be concerned that there's a centralisation of news and information, particularly at a point when misinformation is such a such a, an, an obvious challenge, and that we cannot rely on social media. Now, I want my news from somebody who shops in the same shops as that, that I visit, who sits on the same buses that I visit you know, that I travel around on, who send their kids to schools that are nearby in my neighbourhood. Uh, and, you know, all of those kind of things. I, you know, as citizens, we're based in a place and all the evidence suggests that uh, eco- local economies that prosper have that strong sense of identification. Uh, so for a future incoming government, this should be a priority to decentralise our media and to uh, dis- redistribute power down, which is as part of the uh, the devolution and the levelling up agenda. Um, so this brings us to the consultation on community radio. So co- community radio is kind of typically... Um, it's not for profit. It is stations that are run by volunteers and it has a particular agreed uh, social gain role. So what you're saying is that we're going to the, the community radio station is run uh, based on principles of access and participation that members of a particular community that the station serves are able to play a role in that station and develop content for that that station, and that they are also able to um, uh, take part in 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 stations' activities. So you can become a volunteer, and you can ma- you can become a volunteer manager and go, you know trustee of, of the station if you like. So you have a, an element of direct participation in the station. What other form of media in the UK? has that legal requirement for direct access to be able to walk into a station and say, I would like to get involved. Um, you know, the BBC doesn't do that. They, 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 I've, I've stood in the reception at BBC Radio Leicester and, and, and a, a, a woman was asking if she could speak to somebody about some events uh, that she was concerned about and she was told there was nobody who would, would have a, you know, be able to chat to her. Uh, community radio uh, is not perfect, but it has the legal requirement that if somebody wants to get involved, they should be able to get involved. Um, so, it, and and that is de- the 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 terms of what the station is about is determined by the people, those communities for themselves. It's agreed with Ofcom. I'm still in favour. Uh, I'm not in favour of a free for all. We could move everything over to a social media model and just do it all online. I think regulation and the the what um, licensing by Ofcom does and should do is demonstrate that you are trusted and that you have a high level of accountability and that you're not just you know particularly at the moment with so much misinformation that is is peddled on social media that it's very difficult to know uh, who and what to believe. Um, you can complain to Ofcom and they can investigate your complaint if you're not happy with the content of any British broadcaster. And I think that's the, the broadcasting code, I think, is is incredibly valuable for the protection of decency within our society and our democracy is that you 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 manage things impartially, that you don't have, um, you know, you, you don't invade people's privacy and that you give, uh, you know, you don't incite violence. And there's a whole... Uh, 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 protections that are built in that add to our uh, community deliberation and discourse if 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 run well, uh, and I think that you know community radio community media has that potential to be a really vital tool for the renewal and development of our democracy. Um, so we have to then protect our community radio and 
the market it you know some stations not all stations but some stations um will never can never survive in the marketplace by selling advertising because it might be faith based it might be uh, it's a minority audience it might be a very specialist small community that doesn't get its attention from anywhere else so it's never going to raise large sums of money however there are funding organizations and partnership projects and you can work with local authorities to provide projects and work which can be broadcast and be incorporated into a radio station's output which provide high levels of significant levels of social gain that's what we should be focused on so the community radio consultation that's been undertaken at the moment which is talking about um the, the the amount of money that a radio station can raise from advertising it hasn't changed since uh, uh, early 2000, 2007 I think when it was set and it was at £15,000 then okay index link it you know give it a boost bring it in you know upgrade it in terms of inflation but the principle should be that these are not commercial stations these are there to provide services and support for people who would not otherwise be um, uh, access find content within the marketplace now if somebody says these are too, these, these and it's it's a complaint that's put forward that this is too restrictive that you know Ofcom is micromanaging uh, these stations. Well, it's nothing that they've not signed up for for themselves. So it's the commitments that they've made themselves, uh, which they're being held to. But if the and, and the consultation has come in at a point where we're not sure what the landscape is going to look like post media bill, if. Uh, the landscape after the media bill has gone through is that Ofcom is able to license stations on demand and that there's more capacity both on DAB and on uh, FM and AM and that there are no, you know, the, the, there's no competitively awarded licenses. Well, if you're not happy with working towards the key commitments that you've given as a community radio station, you should be able to transition to an, a, a, an independent license and pay the market rate for that. That's fine. If you don't want those social obligations, that's fine. I'm, I don't think we should hold people to those things. The only caveat is, is that there is available frequencies and that nobody is being... Um, uh, uh, n nobody is losing out. No group is losing out because... You, you know, this station would a station would might be blocking uh, a frequency that somebody else wants to use. That's the only caveat I've got. But if we manage the spectrum more efficiently and effectively, then there's plenty to go around for everybody. And I'm, I, I, I'm, you know, if somebody wants to go on to DAB and they can afford to pay the DAB carriage fees, I'm fine with that. If somebody wants to go on to AM and pay the power costs for running an AM AM transmitter, I'm fine with that. Why do we need to police this in 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 such terms? There's the regulation should come through the content in terms of the broadcast code. That is a great leveler, and I'm very happy to keep the broadcast code in place. And the um, uh, the social gain. So, so the question is, what is the incentive for community radio to exist? Why, why should we bother? Why should we set up stations and support volunteers and develop training programs and build relationships with other, uh, you know, public service organisations and do all of that for 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 very little reward, um, often for nothing, often because we care and we're passionate about it. The government has to start thinking about what the incentive is. And to date, there has been very little incentive for community radio other than stations. So we've got 300 odd radio stations, community radio stations in the UK. I actually suspect that a, a, a significant number of those stations would have taken up independent licenses had they been available and that they would be run as independent stations and again i'm fine with that i'm a pluralist i'm not con trying to control anybody to go under any one umbrella they can go under multiple un umbrellas as far as i'm concerned however some of us still want to do the social gain uh media and the high level of social gain what's the incentive for us that's the question i've got for dcms and the incentive should be that we have recognition verification 
validation from the government that what we are doing is of significant importance socially and that it opens doors and it gives us connections with the health service, the education service, the housing service, the skills services. So it's like a you get a community radio license and it's a gold standard charter mark that you are providing significant social gain. That's how it should be seen. It should be seen as a top class, you know, um, a badge of um, validation uh, that you're a broadcaster who is entirely committed to social gain and that you train volunteers. At the moment, we don't get that recognition from government. It's kind of like, well, you know, it's it's kind of we're, 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 we bother the commercial sector and uh, we're, we're, we're a bit you know, kind of haphazard in the way that we do things. And, you know, it's not very well organised. And there are lots of assumptions made because we're not professional media that are brought on to uh, uh, the, the judgment that is put onto community media is often very much about keeping uh, the, the two very distinct. And social gain is much more important than commercial gain. Um, because you really have to work at social gain. You really have to understand what the social needs are and how to help and facilitate and build relationships with people. Um, you know, it's not to dismiss commercial radio. I'm not a fan of it. I don't listen to it. Um, but there are other ways to develop relationships about place, about identity, about a sense of belonging as a community, as a sense of development in that community. Look at the challenges that exist within different communities. You know the challenges that we're facing about misinformation, climate crisis. There's a you know well-being or health or economic development. There's a there's a whole reason for public authorities to work closely with community radio stations to drive forward social change and to do so in ways that are interesting, entertainment, entertaining and, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, creative and in, uh, and fun. So anyway, uh, these are th these important issues are what we're going to discuss uh, in future meetups so as i say we meet on a wednesday from 6 30 every fortnight on we've got a, a meeting coming up this week uh today's the 12th uh the sunday the 12th so on wednesday we'll be meeting up sign up at uh, patreon.com slash decentered media if you want to take part really welcome people's views and uh, uh the feedback for me because these are my views you know and, and the feedback that we get from uh, other people and to look at this from, from from different perspectives but really asking the question you know how can we build a media ecology uh, which is fit for purpose and to meet the challenges of social need and uh, not just seen as something which is a a, a, a kind of uh, yeah, don't wait for the BBC to represent you build your own you know, media, me, me, media platform um, in order to get that out. The one thing I would say about community media is that it, it really is underpinned by the need for accountability and trust. And that's what having a license with Ofcom demonstrates is that you're held to attention, you're held to account, that your programmes are, are are valid, that your your journalism, your news is valid and that if any members of the public have a complaint, then that can be investigated and tested. And I think that's really important because it in, it keeps one of the things that keeps the UK media uh, from spiralling into a kind of a a, 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 a morass of uh, competing claims and interests and, and all the rest of it. Anyway, uh, great to uh, talk to you. You can read through the blogs which are posted up on the website, which is decentered.co.uk you can follow on twitter and instagram uh, and threads and mastodon i think some which i use more than others uh, and at decentered media is the tags and until next time um yeah um think of, you know think about volunteering for your if you don't already think about volunteering for your local community media newspaper or radio station or what you do on facebook you know there's, there's a million ways to do this, but speak to you soon. 
visit decentered.co.uk or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at decentered media.